Dearly Father, Lord, our God, Lord, you are so amazing. Lord, we are unworthy to be here. We are sinners. But Lord, it's through your grace, through your gift of your son, Jesus Christ, that we are able to be here today and to be free, free from sin. We love you, Lord, and thank you for loving us. In your name I pray, amen. Um, well, good morning. Well, today I, I have a question to see if we can get our PowerPoint going. Do you guys recognize what this is? Do you, do you see? It's kind of hard. I'm sorry, the lighting, I should have got a better picture of it. I'm sorry. But this is the Nobel Peace Prize. And this is the medal that the recipients, the recipients of the Nobel Peace Prize receive. And a brief, brief history of what this prize, prize is all about. On, no, on November 27, 1895, the man Alfred Nobel, that's why it's called the Nobel Peace Prize, signed his last will and testament, giving the largest share of his fortune to a series of prizes. The Nobel Peace Prize, as described in Nobel's will, one part was dedicated to the person who shall have done the most or the best work for a fraternity between the nations and for the, ab and for the, aboli for the abolishing and reduction of standing armies and for holding and for the promotion of peace among the nations. So this is the Nobel Peace Prize. And very few people up to date have received the Nobel Peace Prize. And to receive the Nobel Peace Prize, you have to do something for the good of the world. And there's a certain person who we might recognize who received it. Do you know who this is? Mother Teresa. And for some of you who might not know who Mother Teresa is, a quick little brief history of her. She was born in 1910, and Mother Teresa taught in India for 17 years before, in 1946, she experienced her call within a call, as she called it, to devote herself to caring for the sick and the poor. Her order established a hospice, a center for the blind, aged and disabled, and a leper colony. In 1979, she received the Nobel Peace Prize for her huma humanitarian work. She died in September 1997 and was uh, beautified in October 2000, uh, 2003. And in De December 2015, Pope Francis recognized, uh, as a sec uh, recognized the second miracle, which was attributed to Mother Teresa clearing the way for her to be canonized as Saint Teresa. So I, I don't know about the whole sanctification, and I'm not talking about becoming like Christ, but becoming a saint. I don't, I don't know about all that. But what we do know about Mother Teresa is that she was truly a woman who cared for the needy, wasn't she? No question about that. She had a burning desire for people. She loved people. And she received the Nobel Peace Prize. But as, as I think about the, this prize and as I read the story of Mother Teresa, I can't help but to think, but as Christians, shouldn't we all be Nobel Peace Prize candidates? Because as Christians, isn't this what we're supposed to be doing? As Christians, we're supposed to come to the sin, sick, and needy world and to help them. So in my eyes, we should all be Nobel Peace Prize candidates. And today, I want us to look at who, in my eyes, is one of the first candidates for th this prize. And it's a woman by the name of Dorcas. And many of us know her. And I want us to look at this woman, this great woman in the Bible, and see if there's anything God can teach us through this woman's life for his last day people. So turn with me to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9, verse 32. Acts chapter 9, verse 32. And when you get to Acts chapter 9, verse 32, will you give me an amen? Amen. 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 <clears throat> and in Acts chapter 9, verse 32, it says, Now it came to pass, as Peter went through all parts of the country, that he also came down to the saints who dwelled in Lydda. And I, I just want to stop here. In the Bible, it's it called the believer's saints. Did you know the word used here is, in, in Greek, is hagios? And I just want to point out something to you, that nowhere in the Bible is this word hagios used to describe a person. 
The only time this word hagios is used is when they use it to say holy or to say the Holy Ghost. And there's a reason for this. The reason for that is because of ourselves, no matter what we do, no matter how much we pray, us of ourselves, we can never be a saint. That's why there's no such thing as St. Pau or St. Smithington. I hope that's nobody's here's name. I just made it up. But that there's no such thing as saint this, but as together, as a body of Christ, we are saints. And you know why? Because it's through the love and the grace of Jesus Christ that we can be holy, that we can be pure. And so it's as a collective body that we are saints. And there's no such thing as Saint Pal or Saint whatever. But continue, let's go back to the story. In starting verse 33, it says, there he found a certain man named Ananias who had been bedridden eight years and was paralyzed. And Peter said to him, Ananias, Jesus the Christ heals you. Arise and make your bed. Then he arose immediately. So all who dwell in Lydda and, Ch and Chiron saw him and turned to the Lord. So I have a question here. First we see Jesus here and he, and he heals this paralyzed man. How long was this paralyzed man par bedridden? Eight years. And do you notice what Peter says when he comes to him? When Peter comes up to him, who does he says will heal him? He says, Jesus Christ will heal you. He doesn't say himself. He doesn't say, you know, I'll heal you. No, he says, Jesus Christ will heal you. And here we see something super important. And this is something, uh, to be honest, I'm still struggling with. But you know, in our lives, when we're doing stuff, it's not about our strength, but it's about Jesus Christ. One of, one of my great mentors, he always tells me when, I, when I'm feeling stressed, when, when I don't know what to do, he says, Austin, why are you worrying? You're only helping Jesus. And you know, in our lives, we're only helping Jesus. And it kind of it kind of encourages me because sometimes I don't know about you, but when I have something, I'm like, oh man, I have this much time, and I, I'm going to do this, 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 and it's my power, my strength. I'm going to do this. You know what? If you struggle like I do, you know you're not alone. Did you know one of the greatest missionaries, Paul, struggled with this? Turn with me to Second Corinthians chapter 12. Second Corinthians chapter 12, verses 8 to 10. Second Corinthians chapter 12, verses 8 to 10. And here we see Paul is talking to God, and, and if, you, if you read much of, about Paul, you, you know that his vision after he encountered Jesus on the road was a little blurred. It was pretty weak. So he, he struggled with weak eyes, which is why many times in his letter he says, you know that I wrote this because of my big writing. So here in, in verse 8, it says, Concerning these things, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in your weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my weakness that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in my weakness, in, re in my reproaches, in needs and in persecution, in, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And this is the most amazing thing. And this is something I'm still trying to learn. But it's when we're in over our heads, it's when we have stuff that is way more than we can do, that we give Christ an opportunity to work in our lives. And the amazing thing was when we see our to-do list, when we see everything we got to do, it's not on us to do it. Well, let, me, let me say that again. It's not on us to do it, but as long as we surrender our lives to Jesus, it's on Him to accomplish it through us. So the, stress, the pressure isn't on us, but it's on God. And that gives me comfort because when I have so much stuff to do, when I don't know how I'm going to do it, all I have to do is trust in God and everything will be okay. Well, that's always easier said than done. But let, let's go back to our story. Let's go back to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9, and we're going to start in verse 36. 
Acts chapter 9, verse 36. Acts chapter 9, verse 36. And when you get there, give me a hearty amen. <laughs> amen. It says, At Joppa there was a certain disciple named Tabitha, which is translated Dorcas. This woman was full of what? Good works and charitable deeds, which she did. But it happened in those days when she became sick and died, when they had washed her, they, led her, they laid her in the upper room. And since Lida was near Joppa, and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent two men, imploring him not to delay in coming to them. And what's interesting here is Joppa from, where Lida from Joppa was about 11 miles. So when they heard about Peter being there, it would have spread pretty quickly, because that's, that's less than a day's, a day's journey. So they come to Peter, and the, and the thing is, as we read this, we don't know how long she had been dead. Because you see, during this culture, when someone died, they gave it a period of three days to find out if they were really dead. And the reason for this is like, maybe they could go into coma, and so, something could happen where they just feign being dead, where they, it just seems that they're dead. So during this culture, they would wait three days to see if, you know, maybe they're going to just pop up or if they're going to be okay. And then they say, okay, they're actually dead. So we, at this point, we don't know, we don't know how long she had, she had passed away. We don't. But what we do know is that the believers believed in God. Because they laid him in the room and they came to Peter knowing that she was dead. And they said, we believe that God can still do something. And as I look at the faith of these believers, it makes me think of, you remember Mary and Martha with Lazarus? You remember that story? Lazarus passes away. He's been in there for four days and, and see, four days, so it had been one day after the three days or however you want to look at it. And, they, and Jesus comes and Martha's like, man, if you had been here earlier, Lazarus wouldn't have died. And he says, I am the life. I am the resurrection. And she's like, yes, I, I, I know he'll rise again, but at the second coming. And we know how the story goes, don't we? Because what, what, what did Jesus do? And it's funny, if you look at the story, we talked about it last night in our, in our worship. I, I, I like to invite you, maybe this Sabbath, when, when you're done and you're back at home, go through John chapter 11. And if you go, when you go through John chapter 11, you'll notice that nobody listens to Jesus but the dead guy. No one listens to Jesus but the dead guy. And so as you see, the, it was Lazarus when Jesus called out to him that he was brought back to life. And maybe these believers had heard this story. So they said, you know what? It's not too late. So they called Peter. And let, let's see, let's go back to verse 39. Going back to verse 39. It says, then Peter arose and went with them. When he had come, they brought him to the upper room. And all the widows stood by him weeping, showing the tunics and garments which Dorcas had made while she was with them. And you know what's interesting as we look at the story? Nowhere in the story does Dorcas speak. She doesn't speak. But from the story, we can already tell what kind of woman she was, can't we? And she didn't have to say it because, you see, it was her actions that defined her, not her words. And what's also interesting, as we look at this, we see that Dorcas, that it says the widows. And here we see that the writer of Acts points out the widows. Because later, as we're going to see here, he says the believers and the widows. So because of that, we don't know. Maybe the widows weren't Christians, but that doesn't necessarily mean so. But what they're pointing out is that, they're, that she took care of the widows. And why this is important is during this time, to be a widow, because you see, life is totally different from when it was back then. To be a widow was one of the worst situations you could find yourself. And, be, and before you say, oh, that's messed up, you see, back then it was a little messed up. Because women back then weren't so much a human being, but they were property. And if you ever want a, a really interesting research, look up how the Greeks viewed marriage. It's a mess. I mean, they, they'd have different wives. It was, it was a mess. But during this time, if, if a woman lost her husband, she would have lost a steady income. And, but the number one thing is she would have lost protection. 
And so that's why when in the Bible, when you see when someone becomes a widow, they go to their family for protection. Because during that time, anybody could break down the door, anybody could come in, and it was the man who protected him. So here we see that she took care of the widows. And when it says that they, the widows showed Peter the clothing, it's very likely that the widows were actually wearing the clothing. Because the widows, they, weren't, they didn't have a lot of money, they weren't well-to-do. So it was very likely that the clothes that Dorcas had made for them were the only clothes they had. And so this is the woman, this is, this is what we see of, of Dorcas who's taking care of the widows. And you know what's so amazing is? Dorcas got what Christianity is all about. Go with me to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. James chapter 1. Verses 26 and 27. James chapter 1, verse 26 and 27. And give me an amen when you get there. Amen. amen. And verse 26 says, If anyone among you think he is religious as does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. And verse 27, Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit the orphans, and the widows and their troubles, and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. This is what pure, what does it say? Pure and undefiled religion is. To take care of the needy, to take care of the orphans and the widows. And this is what Dorcas was doing. And isn't this what we need to be doing? And you see, as, as we look at this, as we look at this, sometimes I think we can get so caught up in everything else in the world because we have so many things to do that sometimes, I know in my life, sometimes I lose focus on this. And a while back, I was reading this article from the Adventist Review, and it was entitled, Is It Time to Close Our Churches? Maybe. And as I read, the, the, this, the writer begins by talking about a situation that happened in the town of Bangar, Maine. That's where his church was. He talked about in the city where he lived, he attended a council meeting where they approved for the police officers and first responders to be able to use Narcon to save the lives of people who overdosed. Um, and you know, this item passed through the meeting. And as the item passed, a councilman of the town continued to tell a story of a young teenage boy who had just recently overdosed on opiate. And as he told the story, the people around him started tearing up because they knew this young man. But you see, this was an isolated story. Maine is known for having the highest rate of prescription. Is it opiate? Is that how you say it? Is that, is that right? Okay, opiate addiction in the nation. And this had caught the attention of many citizens. And just a week before this meeting, the Daily News had held a summit at their local convention center called the One Life Project. And 400 members of the community had gone to talk and brainstorm on how the community could help stop the spread of this addiction. But the writer continues to tell the story. He says, while all this was happening, his church had no clue about it. Because as the church, because as this was happening, as the, as the city was dealing, and the community was dealing with the problem of opiate ad addicts, the church was dealing with its own problems. You see, they were working on a church plant, praise the Lord, and they were worried about the loss of musicians and how it would affect their worship service. And the writer said, and I quote, we worried about losing musicians while the community is worried about losing lives. And later on he said, a crisis is sweeping my state, killing young and old. How can we claim to minister in Christ's name and ignore this? Can we learn a, can we learn a lesson from Maine? That as a church, you know, it's so easy to get caught up in our busy lives, to get caught up in all the things we have going on, but as a church, we cannot forget that the reason we are here is to minister to the poor and needy. 
to, to minister to those who are in our community. Because if we're so focused on our own problems that we forget the bigger problem, how can we call ourselves Christians? Uh, as this article said, and, and as we continue, I just want us to go to John, uh, to our scripture reading, John chapter 13. John chapter 13, verse 34 and 35. Because I want us to look at what Jesus says, what, what he says about being a disciple, how the world will know that we are disciples. And that's John chapter 13, verse 34 and 35. Give me an amen when you get there. Amen. amen. And in John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35, it says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you, love, if you have love for one another. And this is how we do it. As a church, we need to love each other. Those of us, the people sitting next to you in your pews, the people in, our, in, our, in this church, we need to love each other. But you know, what is love? That's a question sometimes we gotta, we gotta answer. Like, so to make, this is just an analogy, this isn't true, but let's say I, I, have, a, I have a girlfriend, and let's say that I tell her I, I love her, but I don't talk to her, I don't text her, I don't, I don't do anything nice to her. In fact, I, 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 I talk to other, other women, and this is just an analogy, don't be like, oh, that pastor, no, no, this isn't true, <laughs> this isn't true. And when she comes around, she comes to, to talk to me, and I'm like, oh, no, I'm not busy. Not now, I'm busy, but I love you. Do I really love her? No, well, one, I'd be single. But two, but two, is that really love? Because love is an action, isn't it? It's more than just words. And my question is, do we truly love each other? Are we showing each other that we love each other through our actions? And, and as, I, as I was looking through this, as I was preparing this, it, it hit me in the heart because so many times I tell people, oh, I love you, oh, I'll pray for you. But am I showing them this in my actions? And as, as a church, I think it's, it's just important for us to look at ourselves and say, are my actions showing that I love the people around me? Are my actions showing the people in the pew right next to me, behind me, in front of me, that I truly love them? Are my actions showing that I love my neighbors, my coworkers? that random person at Walmart. What are our actions telling the world? And before, before we go too much in this, I want to ask you a question. What do you think is the most important word in the whole English dictionary, the whole English language? What do you think is the most important word? God? Love? Well, you know, um, a man by the name of Oscar Thompson he makes an argument that the most important word in the whole English dictionary or whole English language is relationships. Because he says that relationships is the bridge on which love is carried through. And you know, and as we look at this, the question is, do we have a relationship with our community? Do we have a relationship with our neighbors? Do we have a relationship with our coworkers? And this is where it gets hard, because I'll be honest, it's, it's easy to hand, go door to door and hand out glow tracks. It's easy just to hand them something and to walk away, but you know what's hard? Is to actually to get to know them. Because sometimes it's uncomfortable. You know, you meet some people who are from different walks of life and God puts them in your life and it's, it's uncomfortable to have that relationship. But this is what God has called us to do. God has called us to be relational in our lives. You know, one of the, one of the most amazing things, uh, I was reading this article about a missionary who he was in Peru, and he said it was the first time he ever had witnessed this, that he was in Peru and they had no technology, had nothing, you know, and he, he was with a group of young kids and they had no technology, nothing, which is like a miracle. They had nothing to, to keep them occupied, and he said all they would do all day, and they loved it, was hang out together and learn more about the kids there. And he says, as we were just together talking, having fun, he says, as we were doing this, he's like, I, I experienced what it would be like in heaven, where all the distractions are away, all our time cards are away, all our, our busy schedules are away, 
and we can truly just have time to be together, to learn more about each other. And this, and this is what we are called to do. We are called to have a relationship with our neighbors, with our coworkers, with each other. And it's only through a relationship with each other that we can love each other as Christ loves us. But, but let's continue. Let's, let's go back to the story. <clears throat> go back to Acts chapter 9. So turn with me back to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. And let's start in verse 39. Acts chapter 9, verse 39. It says, Then Peter arose and went with, th with them. When he had come, they brought, it, uh, brought him to the upper room. And all the widows stood by him weeping and showing the tunics and garments which Dorcas had made while she was with them. But Peter put them all out, and he knelt down and prayed. And turning to the bo body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. Then he gave her his hand and lifted her up. And when he had called the saints and the widows, he presented her alive. And it became known throughout all Joppa, and many believed on the Lord. And so it was that he stayed many days in Joppa with Simon a Tanner. You know what's so amazing about the life of Dorcas? Even in life and death, it was a testimony to God. And through her life and through her, her death and her resurrection, she was able to bring the people in her city to God. And my, my question today is, by our actions, by the way we live our lives, are we bringing people to God? Can we learn a lesson from Dorcas to live a life, to follow Christ, because there is no greater prize. You know, Nobel Peace Prize, that's, that's great. But honestly, just give me Jesus. Amen. Amen? And to live a life for Jesus, that is why we're here. This is why, as a church, we are here to show the world who, how amazing Jesus Christ is, of a, of a God who gave his one and only son to die a painful death for you and I, so that we no longer have to be slaves to sin, but that we can be free through Jesus Christ. And this week, I want to challenge you. I want to challenge myself to live a life like Christ, to bring people close, close to me and to, to love them by my actions and by my words. And this morning, I, I want to invite you. Um, if some of you as you heard this message, we're thinking, you know, maybe it's time that I truly started following God. It's time that I truly want follow God. I, I just want to invite you, uh, take out one of these. These are a, a blue card. And I'd just like to invite you, if, if you want to give your life to God this morning, to write your name, your date, your address, and, and put down that you would like to be baptized. And then at the end, just give it to myself, give it to Pastor Charles, give it to an elder, a deacon, and, and turn it in. And, for the rest of you, maybe you've already been baptized, but maybe you haven't been loving others because you haven't really experienced God's love. Maybe the reason your life isn't a living testimony to God is because you don't really know God and you want to know God. And if you've already been baptized and you're in this situation, I'd like to pray with you. I'd like to help you walk through this journey together. I'd like for you to experience the love of God so that as a church, as a last day church, we can show the whole world God's love. And finally, you're like, you know, I've, I've done this, and, and right now I feel like God is calling me to do something, is calling me to service. And did you know what our church does? They have two amazing, amazing community services. The first one, ironically enough, is called Dorcas. And Dorcas is every other Sunday from 10 to 12, and they, and they make hats, blankets for kids, that, for kids in need, for kids that are going through cancer. They make it for the poor and needy, just like Dorcas did. But another one, and many of you know this one, the Hope Clinic. You know the Hope Clinic sees almost over 100 people a week from our community 
They are meeting the needs of our community, but they could use some more help. So if, if you're looking at your time card if, or your time schedule and you're saying, you know, I have a few, I have a day, I have some hours, I'd invite you, you know, talk to Diane Westcott. She could always use some more help. And maybe as a church, as a community, we can, bring, we can meet this community's needs and bring them to Jesus. And finally, if none of those sound, you know, none of those meet your needs, there's something I'd like to challenge all of us to do. And that's to be a neighborhood missionary. So this week, this is, this is what I'm going to do and I, I want to challenge you to do. You know we're having that evangelistic series, right? I want you to find one neighbor, maybe you talked to him, maybe you haven't, and to do one nice thing for them. For no reason. Other than just to show them God's, to show them Jesus' love. The only reason. Do something nice. What, what, what nice is, you decide, talk to Jesus about it, talk to God, and say, God, what neighbor do you want me to, talk, to do something nice for? Who do you need me to talk to? And I want to invite you this week, if every single one of us did one nice thing to our neighbor, just imagine what happened. And you know what? I'd also like to, to invite you, if this week, if God has told you, you know, there's some people I need you to have come to these meetings, to take out a card, if you need some more, let us know, and to invite them and then to come with them here, to build that relationship with them. So when we all get to heaven, there will be people from our acts of kindness who will be there. And isn't that what it's all about? Because Jesus Christ is coming soon, and may the community know that we love them. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord our God, Lord, as we look at the life of Dorcas, who in my eyes is the, one, of Christian, well, one of Christianity's first Nobel Peace Prize candidates, Lord. Lord, we just, we want to learn from, from her the lessons of life, to love and to, to, to take care of the needy, Lord. Lord God, we just want to be your people. We just want to follow you. We want to tell the world about you, Lord. So Lord, we just pray that you give us your, an extra dose of your love, Lord, that you ha have our heart overflow with your love, so that as we share with our neighbors, we don't have to make up love, we don't have to manufacture love, but that, Lord, it'll be love from you. And that, Lord, from this day forward, that there will be people in heaven because of you working through us. Lord, we love you and thank you for loving us. In your name I pray, amen.